Paleography has a vivid vocabulary. The Latinate exacting terms which catalog the scripts of pre-modern and certainly medieval manuscripts comprise the heart of the discipline's tools. These terms offer not just a sophisticated taxonomy, but also a shorthand for the potential functions and cultural roles a script might have historically played. For instance, the script term textualis implies liturgy, formality, and authority, while another, secretary, indicates bureaucracy, utility, and facility. What these terms reveal about medieval perceptions of the handwriting they label, however, is less straightforward. It is important to acknowledge that a modern paleographical term is not the same as the medieval description, though they may appear identical. What did the wealthy widow Joanna de Walkingham mean when she bequeathed a certain book written in Litera Anglicana in her 1346 will? We may never know, but we cannot assume that she was referring to the same Anglicana that M.B. Parks coined in 1969 for a swathe of visually related scripts used to copy late medieval texts in England. Paying attention to the gap between medieval and modern perceptions of scripts allows for medieval meanings, often buried under modern connotations, to enrichingly add to understandings of historical handwriting. Despite its routine use in paleographical discourse, bastard is a jarring word to describe scripts. This adjective was used by medieval writing masters throughout Europe to label a range of scripts, most notably the Lux Lettre Bâtarde, or bastard secretary script of the later 1400s. Almost a century ago, Hilary Jenkinson commented that, in essence, medieval bastard scripts are a cross or compromise between two other well-known styles. The word compromise is telling here, as if the two scripts are somehow in conflict or not typically aligned. In explaining the term's usage, modern paleography tends to focus on the hybridizing of low and high forms that open themselves up to striking social analogies. Returning to Parks and Anglicana, let's consider his understanding of what bastard Anglicana is. This epithet refers to the display script that adapted Anglicana formata with the decorative features of textualis. In explaining his terminology, Parks writes, quote, a bastard hand is essentially the product of a union between base and between a base script and a noble one. Between a cursive script, the informal handwriting of the documents at the bottom of the hierarchy, and textura, the display script at the top, unquote. He supports this with a footnote citing an abecedarium from 1552 that defines bastard as begotten between base and gentle. Parks's definition is rooted in a pre-modern notion of classed intermingling. The Middle English noun bastard also held this connotation. John Trevise's translation of Randolph Higdon's Polychronicon describes the Persian king Darius Notus as, quote, a bastard, or he that is a get of a worthy father and a bore of an unworthy mother. It is noteworthy that the idea of illegitimacy is tacitly implied at most, and by no means explicitly at the forefront of Trevise's definition. What he wishes to emphasize is that bastard signifies a union from two distinct social ranks. It is the dictionaries that tend to accentuate a sense of illegitimacy in their definitions. The Oxford English and Middle English dictionaries, the Dictionary of Medieval Latin from British sources, and the Anglo-Norman Dictionary all agree that bastard, in both medieval and modern usage, denotes something that is adulterated, inferior, or somehow not genuine. But I'm curious about how invested the medieval term bastard was in these connotations that make the expression so jarring to modern ears. The moralistic suggestions that hang vaporously over its modern usage imply a condemnatory tone, a sense perhaps that medieval readers and writers saw bastard scripts as impure or not genuine, and that paleographers now maintain an inherited technical term while wryly reenacting a quaint moralism. But did people in the Middle Ages use the term this way or understand it this way? A mid 15th century writing master called Robertus de Tours, whose pattern book survives in the Bibliothèque Nationale de France, showcases Lettre Bâtarde alongside two other related scripts, which he calls Lettre de Minute and Lettre Curiale. Here, on the top of folio 28 recto, we see a rubricated heading signaling which script Robertus is modeling, Lettre Bastarde in this case. The text snippet below is from the Vulgate's translation of Psalm 148, Laudate Dominum de Celis. Bastard letter, as modeled by Robertus, is an ornate script based on cursive letter forms such as looped D, single compartment A, and open tail G. These graphemes are elevated by calligraphic movements of the pen that carefully applied decorative features, 
like spiky little horns on E and word final S, or the dark shading of F and long S as seen on the folio's final line. The richness of the script is further complemented by Roberta's inclusion of lavish, often painted cadles in initials and selected top line ascenders. The combination of low letter forms with higher ornamentation seems to mark what is bastard here. But hybridity is only part of it. Robertus's other two script categories imply that he viewed Lettre Batarte as a kind of middle road. His Lettre de Minute, which can be seen on the next leaf at folio 29 verso, shares many of the same features as the Bastard, except it is smaller, tighter, and slightly less ornate. Meanwhile, his Lettre Curiel, seen here on folio 30 recto, is larger, more embellished, and engrossing than the Bastard. Note in particular the decorative crook on the looped ascender of D, as in Venerandum on the top line. All three of these scripts exhibit varied combinations of low and high features. It is the bastard that occupies a position right in the middle between smaller and bigger, plainer and fancier. Robertus's samples of Lettre Bastard indicate that as a medieval script term, bastard occupies an aesthetically balanced middle ground. Strikingly, it is also unburdened by a subtext of adulteration or impurity. Further context shows that the term bastard was applied not only to scripts, but also to many other late medieval prestige commodities in English, French, and Latin sources. A history of the term used in this way not only provides a perspective for script as a product, but also gives a clearer view of the middle way bastard objects occupied in medieval production and consumption. Take saddles, for instance. Bastard gilded saddles are mentioned in an exchequer account roll from 1419, and the Parliament rolls of 1423 mention a bastard saddle covered with crimson and velvet studded with gilt silver. These both seem to be rich objects, and so their bastard nature might express a merging of two types of saddle, or perhaps they are bastard because they signal a merging of two distinct classes of material, low leather and high velvet and high silver, for instance. Whatever its specifics, the term seems to refer to sim a simple hybridity in design and making rather than a description of something that is cheapened. Bastard wine was a form of sweetened spiced wine originating from southern France and Spain, an early 14th century Hiberno-French translation and adaptation of the Secreta Secretorum describes one variety from La Rochelle. Bastard wine of La Rochelle is strong and dry and sweet in flavor and very keenly harsh on the head and body when drunk in excess, but it causes a good release from the stomach, for which reason physicians say that one ought to drink it when going to bed. A full survey of this wine's drawbacks and benefits is given. It is strong, it delivers a walloping hangover, but it also has health benefits when consumed in moderation. Its bastard quality may well come from this dualistic characterization as both an indulgent libation and a medicinal treatment. It might also be bastard because sweeteners and spices have been added to it. Either way, processes of mixing for mixed purposes define this type of wine. This begins to suggest a sense that bastard refers to medieval procedures of mixing for instrumental purposes. Objects must become intermingled with other objects in order to achieve specific utilitarian aims. Medieval culinary texts offer a deeper view into the implications of bastard as a reference to processes of production. The 15th century Middle English cookbook preserved in British library Harley MS 279 mentions gravies, creams, sausage, sauces, and pottages as having bastard alternatives. Take, for instance, the oysters and gravy bastard, which follow the regular oysters and gravy. The bastard version uses many of the same ingredients, like ginger, sugar, and saffron. It even adds uh, ground pepper and salt. What seems to make it bastard is its simplified process. The regular recipe is fussier, involving several stages of parboiling and then a final boiling of all the ingredients together. The bastard version involves making a simpler gravy with the oyster brine, some ale, and water, and allowing it to boil with the spices before adding the raw mollusks at the end. Mm. Another pair of recipes makes this even more explicit. Vion de Cipris Bastard occurs just before Vion de Cipris Real, a sort of medieval meatloaf. As with the oysters and gravy, both recipes consist of more or less the same ingredients, including egg yolks, ground capon, and chicken meat with rich spices like ginger and saffron. But again, the bastard recipe is less elaborate, involving lower heat and less straining. The real version, in contrast, 
calls for an involved syrup to be made from spiced honey, raisins, broth, and wine to be drizzled over the meat. This gastronomical language uses some of the most explicit terms of human social hierarchy available to medieval English, bastard and royal, to pinpoint not quality per se, but rather the efficiency and time required to produce a finished product. A bastard dish is not necessarily worse, just less time consuming to whip up. All of this ultimately shows that the descriptor bastard, while distilling the language of problematic propagation, also designates a purposeful intermingling of efficiency with refinement in the making of medieval commodities. This enriches a sense of what it meant for medieval readers and writers to describe script as bastard. A bastard script, assuming it functioned like these other products, would have been seen as a category of writing defined by a compromise between care and facility. A bastard script forges a product whose tempered production modifies beautiful scripts to make them easier to write, rather than debases them in a cheapened imitation. My interests in the cultural meanings behind medieval idioms of script, like bastard, have broader implications for medieval literature. What can bastard scripts tell us about the literary texts they preserve in manuscript? How can literature help expand our categories of script? I offer some initial answers to these questions by turning to John Gower's behemoth bilingual poem, Confessio Amantis, or The Confession of the Lover. At first, this text might seem a strange place to explore bastard literary or paleographical aesthetics. The word bastard does not occur in any form or language in the poem's 33,000 lines. But the poem's formal principles interlace Latin and English verse forms which guide the reader through a prologue and eight books in two distinct registers. Gower famously describes his goals for this hybrid structure in the Confessio's prologue. Worrying that reading a text that is too serious or too full of wise writings might dulleth oft a man's wit, Gower proposes to go the middle way, compositionally speaking, between lust and lore, so that his reader might like what he writes. Go the middle way. Gower envisions his Confessio to be a negotiation between instruction and pleasure, wisdom and enjoyment. In other words, it is a compromise between high and low forms, a bastard poem. Lingering on bastard aesthetics as being integral to the Confessio's literary program, we can begin to explore how poetic and paleographic principles can be seen to mirror each other, and indeed how poetry can help expand the potentials for what bastard scripts can be. This is an image of the opening folio of Cambridge St. John's College MSB 12, which I'll refer to hereafter as J one of the nearly 50 extant manuscripts of the Confessio. J is unusual among the fairly uniform Confessio manuscripts produced before 1450. It is smaller than average and, with the scribal dialect located to northern Herefordshire, provides a rare example of a Confessio manuscript potentially produced outside of London. Moreover, it has a distinctive script. This next image shows more clearly Jay's lack of stiff, knobbly letter forms and its loopingly hooked ascenders on H, L, and B, features of Anglicana, which give an impression of a cursive hand. But Jay's script is infused with textualis in many respects. An upright vertical quality to the letters and a lack of splay is present. Set semi-rotunda minim feet are discernible in M and N. Ligaturing techniques typical of textualis are apparent here as well, such as the biting between D and various vowels, such as day in line nine, as well as kind and hond in line 11 and dawn in line 13. Other textualis features used in J include G and E with a protruding tongue. Additionally, several decorative features suggest a painstaking, almost obsessive quality. Minuscule D has an unlooped ascender in textualis fashion, but is without exception ticked with a small dash at the top of the ascender. There is no obvious purpose for these OTOS dashes other than embellishment. The J scribe also employs a sharp crook on the center ascender of W, making the letter more involved and branched in its appearance. The script of Jay's Confessio is a finicky one that combines graphemes and decorative techniques from cursive and textualis in a unique mode. While this script little resembles the Lettre Batard of Robertus de Tours, or even samples of Parks's Bastard Anglicana, I think it can still be described as bastard due to its careful process of refining cursive graphemes with calligraphic traits. Jay's bastard script participates dynamically in the bastard project of Gower's poetry. 
consider what the lines say alongside what the script looks like. Here is the English text transcribed starting at line four. It stands not in my sufficiency, so great things to encompass, but I must let it overpass and treat upon other things. Therefore, the style of my writings from this day forth, I think change and speak of things not so strange, which every kind hath upon hand and whereupon the world must stand and hath done since it began and shall while there is any man. And that is love of which I mean to treat as after shall be seen. These lines from the opening of book one reiterate Gower's middle way, his bastard poetic suitable for reflecting on the ethics of love, his main subject. The narrator, Amans, must abandon great things so that he might speak of things not so strange. The Middle English word strange designates not just the unfamiliar, but also over embellishment, an object so overwrought that its meaning is obscured. The ticks, dashes, and fiddly nature of Jay's bastard script might actually seem to be working against Gower's poetic thesis, making his English visually strange, even as it seeks a plainness of meaning. Except it doesn't. The script of Jay retains a measured legibility through its bastard quality, unlike a script that is wholly cursive or wholly calligraphic. Jay's is not in danger of being too fluid or too dense, both of which might make it illegible. Its measured intermingling of different visual qualities yield a text that is not so strange, but perhaps just strange enough to give a reader a new way into the poetry, a middle way, a bastard way turning a critical eye to the terms medieval language used to describe handwriting yields nuanced potential for how these texts were made and culturally perceived as objects, how they were read, and how we might continue to gain new understandings of them. Thank you.